Today's guest is uh, Karel van Wolferen. Karel spent four decades uh, living in Japan. He's a lifelong student of geopolitical developments, author of uh, 20 books, uh, I think over 20 books, and I'm very happy uh, we have him here today. Mr. Van Wolferen, um, great uh, you're here. Um, what worries you most? Uh, About the situation in the world at the moment? Geopolitics. Uh, what worries me most is the possibility that because of uh, developments that are out of control, uh, we are moving into a situation where it's not uh, inconceivable that we will have a military clash, a war. And yeah. that could be the beginning of something very big and very terrible. Um, what started these, uh, these developments leading up to a possible new conflict? Quite a yeah. few. There are of course always uh, a number of factors. But the most important one is that... Um, the most important one is Washington and the American necessity to have an enemy. And so even though there was no reason whatsoever to believe in major enemies, after the, the end of the Cold War, after the demise of the Soviet Union, the United States clearly was in need of an enemy to keep a lot of things going. Why, uh, why does the US need an enemy? Partly it's a financial and economic need. You have a military industrial complex, as President Eisenhower called it uh, during his farewell address uh, when he's, you know, at the end of his term. Um, originally he had thought of calling it military industrial congressional complex because the way in which it had developed was that military manufacture uh, took place in most of the states of the United States. Uh, that also meant that representatives in Congress from those states were interested in keeping it going, obviously. That military industrial complex has been described as a kind of Keynesian engine underneath the American economy in general. So that is one factor. Another factor is that um, the Cold War, communism, uh, was a way to examine the political bona fides of anyone in the United States running for office. Are you soft on communism mm -hmm. uh, or are you insufficiently afraid of our common enemy and so on. And that became a politically very important yardstick to measure people's political beliefs and inclinations. So it's easy to drop into this again and when that's Enemy disappeared uh, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union. I think it was a traumatic experience for quite a few Americans at, in the top levels of the government. You've been a student of geopolitical developments for, um, I think, over 40 years. Um, when we look at the United States and go back 100 years, I think the US was then quite isolated and they didn't have a real strong foreign policy. When did the U.S. foreign policy really start to develop? Well, of course, there was one with Wilson uh, and at the, around the time of World War I, but there was always a strong warning not to, ta not to tangle with foreign monsters. And uh, there was, of course, a tradition of American isolationism saying, you know, mm -hmm. the world that we left behind, Europe and other parts of the world, these are not as good as what we have come here to establish, so let's not get mixed up in it. There was, of course, a controversy whether or not to get involved in World War I. Once that happened, then, of course, things changed. 
And of course, the U.S. was a colonial power at one point uh, with the Philippines. Um, so I think that the United States that we have today began uh, at the end of World War II, probably. Uh, what was significant was that the military was not disbanded after the success of World War II. It if, remained in place. If you allow me to go back to the First World War, uh, that's a good hundred years from now, um, I think during that time it was all about the British Empire, not the American Empire. So what has caused the transformation that the major power in this world, um, that did it change from the British Empire towards the American Empire? What has changed? I think, you can, <laughs> I think you can write a book of 800 pages on the causes, but let's, let's stick what's, to what's, what's relevant. Yeah, what, what, is the moment, what is the moment when it became clear that without the United States, important things would not happen, at least not in the West? I think it was the Suez Crisis. Remember yeah. when France and Britain and <coughs> Israel wanted to uh, you know, take the uh, Suez Canal um, and the US had said, no, wait a moment, no. Without our OK, nothing is going to happen. That was the end of British power. That was the end of French power on a global scale. So that was a deciding moment yes. in which the, the, the British, they lost their power. Of course, that power, the loss of power of Britain is very gradual. Uh, and uh, as many think they still have a little bit, everybody always thinks they, they still have a little bit. But uh, that is gone. Now, I think we are living in a world uh, where almost everyone acknowledges the fact of American power. Um, what People in Asia, at least in China, and also Russia especially, and the more belligerent countries in other parts, do not acknowledge is that the United States should have uh, absolute power over everyone. This notion of full spectrum dominance, which was originally a military term, but has been adopted in the US also by other groups that believe that the United States should have unlimited control and should garnish in the world, as it were, that is a notion that, of course, borders on, or it's not borders on, it is pathological. But when did, when did this development start, this full spectrum dominance theme? When, who started with this? Well, you know, after, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, there was this discussion about whether we would have a multipolar world or a unipolar world. This idea of unipolarity became very popular. Mm -hmm. So the United States was going to be the power. And in the West, uh, much of East, Western Europe believed that was only a good thing because after all, you know, we had fought against the bad guys and now the good guys won. And so now the good guys were going to dictate how the rest of the world was going to be run. So we trusted well, the Americans completely in this respect? Completely, From maybe not, but most, I mean, yes. But the I, Europeans, Europeans, there was never any criticism on US foreign policy until yeah, was, the Vietnam War, maybe. Yeah, no, there was. There's always been some, uh, I think. The, uh, the criticism, of course, of the Vietnam War in Europe follows the criticism in the United States of the Vietnam War. You know, the Europeans mm -hmm. didn't invent it. Uh, and, uh, but the Europeans remember the whole uh, controversy about cruise missiles uh, when Carter was president. Uh, no, there has always been some criticism. Today, however, we are in a very odd situation in that Europe by and large, it swallows what the United States is saying. The European media, almost completely, certainly in Northern Europe, swallows the story as lined out, as controlled in uh, New York. Uh, there's the editors of the mainstream media. There's no independent thinking anymore <coughs> in the media? 
There is some, of course, but and then that main line of thinking, the, the, the you know the storylines in the hands of the Americans are copied in London. They're very important also. You have to look at the Financial Times and the BBC as say arbiters of supposedly well-informed opinion on world affairs. And since they have been endorsing the American view on things, uh, especially uh, in the case, recent cases of the Ukraine and Syria, etc., the rest of Europe has hardly had any choice. They think mainstream media have hardly had any choice. There, is very, there are very few exceptions. I can think in Germany of only one exception, that is Handelsblatt, uh -huh. that is edited by a Hungarian. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and also, those exceptions are not very vocal, they're, they're certainly not influential. Um, we've been talking about another subject um, before, and that's who's really in control. Most people think that the President of the United States living in the White House is the most important guy on earth. He takes, we can take all um, mo the most uh, important decisions. You have other ideas. Uh, well, I, think that, I think that with Obama, yeah. that general idea has been eroded, I think. I mean, Obama, in the minds of many people who have slowly woken up, is uh, in the words of David Bromwich writing in, uh, in one of the best British uh, publications, uh, he is the world's most important spectator. <laughs> there he is, standing on the sidelines. All those things are happening. And he comments on that in a very, now very famous interview uh, with Goldberg in the, the Atlantic Monthly some months ago. And when you read that interview, it's quite amazing because here you have the President of the United States, supposedly, you know, the cliche says, the most powerful man in the world. And there you have him commenting on affairs and on how other people think as if he has nothing to do with it. <laughs> as if he has not actually officially appointed the people who are making this policy of which he has, you know, he may be dissenting. But, but presidents so, come and go and, you know, you have all these senior officers in the Pentagon and, and the CIA. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, are they in control? No. <laughs> Who's in control? Nobody. <laughs> well, <laughs> somebody should be in control. <laughs> now, what, what are your views? Let me first, let's, yeah. let's, okay. yeah. let's first look at, you asked about the president. So yeah. look, look at White House and the cabinet, etc. It's been very clear that, that uh, the uh, current White House has inherited a lot of the previous one under uh, George W. Bush. And of course, we all know that it wasn't George W. Bush, but Cheney, who was the pivotal figure in that. Yeah, the vice president. Uh, yes. So Cheney, uh, Cheney worked with uh, activists uh, of a neoconservative bent. And he made sure that he ceded various departments uh, in the government uh, with neoconservative believers. And Obama inherited them. Uh, and then, so of most, course... most new conservatives from the Bush era are still working within... Not necessarily the same people, but they are, you know, they, some of them are still influential, but not necessarily the same people. But they have, they have as it were, created a, a manner of thinking, a way of, you know, uh, political activism, and that has continued, together with another group, the so-called liberal hawks, uh, or the responsibility to protect the R2P people, that have become very big also under Obama, especially under Obama. Yeah, can you mention a few names, the neocons? Which names are connected with these? Uh, well, the, 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 Wolfowitz, the most important, yes, of course, Wolfowitz. And the most important uh, uh, responsibility to protect, I mean, the, the liberal hawks, the most important I think it would be Samantha Power, who is also the, the uh, U ambassador, ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, then you have Susan Rice. Uh, Victoria Nuland. Uh, Victoria Nuland. Uh, she is a real died in the wool uh, neoconservative. And married to Kagan. Married to Kagan, who is a sort of an, an, a, an author, an, an, an ideologue for the neoconservatives. The neoconservatives have evolved. Of course, they began. Uh, much earlier, and they had hardly any political influence, 
uh, but they were um, a different kind of group than what they beca generally became. Now, what you what, can say, okay, one important thing that you can say about these groups, the neoconservatives as well as the liberal hawks, is that when they gain some power, some actual power, when they join government, when they are asked to, uh, to design policies and so on, they sense they have power. And in this case, their idea, their sensation of power has gone to their heads. This is true of the neoconservatives, it is true of the R2P people. Like Samantha Power is a perfect example of it. And so what happens is that you are not limited in the way that more traditional uh, people in government who have had a career, a long career, who have, who have gone through various stages of earlier government appointments and who have also a knowledge of the world uh, <coughs> have gradually accumulated. As you grow into it and as you also are made aware of the responsibilities you have, you think differently than if you've suddenly gained power. Samantha and Power is a perfect example. Every it's a great name, I, eh? no, Samantha no, no, Power. Just, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good name. <laughs> What's I, in the name? Actually, actually, I, actually, I had coffee with her, what might have been tea, in Antwerp, because both of us were there for a book fair. We both had published, recently published a book. And uh, I remember thinking, who are you? And she wasn't all that incensed about what was happening under George W. Bush. She was sort of very much, and I thought, you are an opportunist, but you are very, very low, you know, low down on the things. Then, of course, she was very lucky. She married to one of Obama's good friends. And before you knew it, there she was. When I, when I look at her and when I see her conduct most recently, uh, when she walked out of the UN Security Council meeting as the Russian ambassador was, was talking, talking and was it's about week. something very crucial about Syria. She walked out of there. I thought... That's an embarrassment. Well, I, you know, it's like deep sea divers. When, they, when deep sea divers go to the surface too quickly, they got air bubbles yeah. in the brain and that does something to the brain. This is what happened to her in general, I think. It's unbelievable. I mean, that is... Conduct so totally, utterly undiplomatic, so completely ridiculous in the context of the world we live in now, with the dangers that they themselves have said exist. But was this a it's, deliberate act? Was this planned by her? Something is spontaneous. I don't know whether this was deliberate. There's a lot. I mean, they you have send a disdain. strong signal. To they the have a disdain for Russians, for Moscow, for Putin. They believe that Putin should go, should be eliminated. They want regime change, the Americans? Of course. <laughs> the, whole mo the, whole, uh, the whole exercise of the Ukraine and the, the, you know, what happened after that and this anti the Putin demonization is aimed in the end for the ultimate goal of getting rid of Putin. Will, will they succeed? No. Well, Why not? Who knows? I mean, Putin may made a mistake. I mean, he has so far remained very cool, extremely cool. Yeah. Uh, and he has responded to provocations in about the best way possible. Perhaps you could say that there are two weaknesses there, if, we, if you want to talk about that for, for a moment. Uh, one is that he hesitated in Syria. I think that he should not have uh, believed that this recent ceasefire was in any way, could in any way be taken seriously. You know, maybe Kerry believed it. I don't think Lavrov, his uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, believed it. But he, he allowed this to happen, giving the world an idea that, you know, there was a chance of some arrangement. Uh, and uh, of course, not that, that doesn't exist. The United States, or at least very important forces in the United States that continue to have the overhand, and of course these are mm -hmm. the neoconservatives and the, the liberal hawks, they want to get rid of Assad. Yeah. Assad uh, has to go. It's, it's part of a, it is a part of a plan. A you, know, you start with uh, Iraq, then Syria. Yeah. With Syria, it was military intelligence that stopped it. 
And then you have Libya. Interestingly, by the mm -hmm. way, also is that if you dig into the literature, that it was Samantha, the same Samantha Power who was the most fervent uh, advocate of doing something about Gaddafi and getting rid of him. Uh, then, of course, Syria was next. And after Syria, that's not the end. So, but, but the Americans were surprised that the Russians became very active uh, in Syria. And like the Americans said this week, we, we don't have full control in the airspace, Syrian airspace. Well, the, the Russians were a surprise in many respects. Um, they were a surprise because they were underrated by the propagandists yeah. in the United States. And the danger of propaganda is always everywhere that people who appear to benefit from it start believing it also. Yeah. And you have to be yeah. very careful. Yeah. But this notion of superior American strength may be true in some ways, but already has been shown not to be true in the, in the case of uh, Russian military capacity. Interestingly, when, when uh, Russia began uh, to be active in Syria, lots of what was happening did not reach uh, the news media in Europe. Mm -hmm. There was what I can only uh, consider a news blackout. Mm -hmm. People did not know what was happening. Is that because there are no boots on the ground? There are no journalistic boots on the ground in Syria? Or? Well, even if there were, I mean, there are journalistic boots on the ground in Aleppo at the moment, oh. and they're being yeah. fed with stories from propaganda centers, right, in Aleppo. All this is documented. Is that the main problem of journalism? Uh, yes, I mean, journalism, if you want to talk about journalism, you want to talk about a very sad case, you know. You talk about, you will talk about something that has become, I'm talking about serious journalism, the yes. journalism that I still knew very much so. You started uh, say in, uh, as a journalist, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, in the, the 1970s and 1980s. That kind of journalism is dead. Uh, the mainstream, oh. the mainstream uh, newspapers and uh, media operations in general, and TV, of course are no longer serious. There are very few exceptions. But we still have Reuters, we still have uh, the BBC, so... Uh, the BBC is a very sad case. I, mean, I think that the BBC, when the BBC changed, I think it happened uh, in the reign of uh, George W. Bush. The first Iraqi Since war. then it's just been uh, downward. Uh, the Financial Times, I think, is very, very, very uh, sad case. Uh, and of course, the New York Times. Look, I mean, they endorsed many, Hillary. Uh, they endorsed Hillary. So, uh, how independent can you be? <laughs> uh, look, um, the New York Times was a, a guide for many people here in the Netherlands and in much of Europe. The International Herald Tribune changed into the International New York Times, and although much, much less influential now. Than it, than it was when it was the Herald Tribune, uh, it still is kind of a guide as to what to think of world affairs. Um, European newspapers and publications do not normally have enough correspondence on the spot. Mm -hmm. And even if, they, even if they have, more and more, they have been, they're being told by their editors what to write and what to leave out. It's very often, what you leave out, that's crucial. It's not have so you, much, have much, much the lies that you tell. But that, that's a strong statement. Have you experienced this firsthand? Or did you hear this from I colleagues? <laughs> I left this trade, which is what it is. Yeah. It's not a profession, journalist. It's a trade. Uh, I left it uh, before all these developments. I began to write books. At the time when, when did you uh, leave? When was it? This was the my, uh, of 90s? course, I still I still wrote some maybe some pieces for an opinion page or so. But as a real journalist, you left in as the nineties. An active journalist, uh, it was in uh, in uh, yeah eighty nine ninety. Yeah. So what has changed? What, what did you hear from former colleagues that the editors were really um, telling them what to write and what to leave out? Of course, journalists are not really eager 
to talk about what they understand are their limitations, unless they're arrested or unless they, you know, they have received uh, uh, some, uh, <laughs> some notice from uh, a, uh, 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 an intelligence agency that they should, and if they want to talk about it. But other than that, they don't talk about their self-censorship. Yeah, when you sit down with them and when you have a few drinks with them, then they do. Of course, I mean, I know about self-censorship as a system in Japan. It's very common. I wrote about it a great deal, and I have many Japanese friends, former colleagues, who will talk with you about that, of course. Uh, in, uh, in the rest of the world, as I am no longer, I'm no longer moving in those circles, I don't hear it from direct sources, so, but I know. So I know it's, 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 not, it's not direct censorship, you call it self-censorship? Well, much more effective. Why? I mean, self-censorship is effective. Because with self-censorship, you don't have a case of antagonism of a, a party, the, 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 news, the, uh, the newspaper or a TV station, against an institution that wants to control it. Yeah. You much have, more effective. It's, it's much more effective. And also, once this is it, it's very important to understand. Once you have taken the position on some elementary point, it's very difficult to go back because you would have to then concede yeah. that you have been wrong all the time. Yeah. Look at, I mean, it's a wonderful case in point is the Ukraine so called revolution, which was actually a coup d'etat. Yeah and the, the way in which it is covered in the press here in the Netherlands, but also in much of Northern Europe, and the shooting down of the MH17, that Malaysian airliner. Once you have taken the position that, of course, yes, the it Russians have done it, yeah. indirectly maybe, but it was Putin who was behind it. Once you have taken that position, you have to stick to it. And <clears throat> we are going to see more of it in the, in the immediate future because new reports are coming out. And as you read this, you realize they're worthless. They're not worth the paper they're written on because also those authorities can't go back. They are supposed to be honest uh, uh, institutions studying this with an eye to uncovering truth, etc. But that's not what they are. They are <laughs> allied in so many ways to a web of other intelligence agencies and to governments and to media that makes it impossible for them to be truthful. But if you um, look at M MH17 case as a murder case and you're a detective and you ask yourself the question, who benefits? Who has benefited most out of this disaster? Well, I don't, <laughs> if I ask you the question, what will you say? Not the Russians. No, who benefited? Well, what, what, the, the, was the, 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 what was the most important immediate uh, result of it? A full blame on Russia. It was joining the European Union member states, joining in sanctions against Russia yeah. that Washington had wanted all along, but the Europeans yeah. didn't see the use for it or the need for it. Or the, you know, so the timing was perfect. The timing was very good. And, and the place so, and, and the location course, was very beneficial And then, of course, that was well. followed then. It was also, it was the Crimea, the, the way in which uh, this is a story that the reality of that story has not been revealed by any of the mainstream media in the Netherlands and very few elsewhere, I think maybe some in Germany. <clears throat> also in Britain, you, have, you still have a little bit of a critical press, but not the daily press anymore. Unfortunately, The Guardian has also gone, I think, uh, very unfortunate. So the annexation uh, of the Crimea so was a different story? It was an annexation. But this that is that's it. how, how the choice of it. Yeah, the choice of words, annexation, annexation, annexation. When I read commentary and somebody says annexation, even though he, this person may be against the demonization of Putin, even though this person is against the way in which Washington wants to restart the Cold War, to have World War, Cold War II. <clears throat> Even those people, when they talk about annexation, you realize they haven't studied the actual history. What happened was that you have a coup d'etat in Kiev. One of the first things that the new government, having come to power <clears throat> through a coup, does 
is to say from now on we will only have as an official language Ukraine language, no longer Russian. But a large part of the Ukraine. That was two is, years ago. Which is a yeah. country that is an amalgam of, you know, of groups. Uh, <coughs> then <coughs> they are Russian speakers, including the ones living on the Krim, the Crimea. So, <coughs> first of all, look at it from a point of view of uh, Moscow, anyone in Moscow, not only Putin, but anybody who would be in Putin's position. There you have an attempt of the United States to expand its influence through NATO into the Ukraine, and of course also part of the Ukraine is the Crimea. The Crimea is also, with Sebastopol, that is a port, that is the most important port for the Russian, Russian Navy, Navy yeah. because it's the only one through the year, warm water port. All the other ports that the Russian Navy have are part of the part of the year are covered in ice. So you have the idea that NATO is going to control the Russian naval port. In the That's impossible. It cannot so happen. So Putin had to act. Well, what happened was that, like the people in eastern Ukraine who did not want to accept the coup d'état government uh, in Donetsk and Lubansk and so, and so on, <coughs> like them, also the people on the Crimea decided, no, we don't want this. And they held a referendum. Okay, that referendum was without any question, I mean, you're talking about, what, 95% yeah. or something along those yeah. lines. This then, the propaganda in the Western media is, ah, you know, that's not an honest referendum, that's, that's not, that's, you know, it's, it's propaganda. You, et you et believe et the results? That referendum, was for the uh, population of the Crimea to become independent. And then once having become independent, they asked Moscow, mm -hmm. can we perhaps join yeah. again? Yeah. By the way, these other provinces in Eastern Ukraine had asked the same thing. And Putin did not want to bring them back into the Russian Federation. He didn't want to, uh, to have them as a, an extra concern, and also what the Russian leaders in Moscow have wanted, especially since the aggressiveness of the West, the United States, is a kind of a buffer state between what used to be Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact countries, and Russia. And that's an obvious geopolitical desirable. But which so, forces, which forces were behind the revolution in Kiev? There were, of course, local forces. Uh, you, had, um, you had definitely a movement among students and educated people. They had been worked on by uh, the uh, NGOs, uh, the non-governmental organizations that are sponsored by uh, Soros, has a whole bunch of them and also the National Endowment of Democracy, the NED, which is, uh, yeah. you know, works with uh, congressional money. Uh, they are, this is an interesting, this is really an interesting story because the NED is an example, is run by Carl Gershman. I happen to know him, I've met him about three times maybe. And uh, we taught, this was during the Cold War. And what they did was to undermine sitting communist governments by in, in non-violent ways, you know, like you know, helping people publishing samizdat underground literature, by uh, training uh, journalists to uh, you know to give a three-dimensional picture of the world, and by things that you would say, well, it's not too bad. They get then East Europeans get an idea of how things may be on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So when the <coughs> Berlin Wall came down. When the Cold War ended, those NGOs were still there, all over. Yeah. <laughs> and they, were, they had to do something. So they just continued their subversive operations. So they're used in, by... In Georgia and Ukraine and so on. Where we had all these colored revolutions. Uh, the color revolutions. Yeah. So this pattern can be seen in all these former Eastern European... Yeah, and the, the, you know, as Victoria Nuland, she openly said, you know, we've spent five billion, billion with a B, yeah. 
dollars uh, indirectly supporting this. We can't see Supporting the government. coup in but Ukraine. Support, supporting the coup. Yeah, but which was then presented as a revolution. Is the Ukraine the big prize for the US, given its geopolitical position? Well, it was Brzezinski who said that this is really what you need uh, because it's the entrance to, well, the rest of the Eurasian continent. It was Brzezinski's security. Uh, look at it. I mean, let's take a step back. You want to talk geopolitics. Let's take a step back. Here we have this huge landmass, Eurasia. I mean, mm -hmm. Europe and then uh, the Asian part of Europe with, of course, China and Russia as the most important countries yeah. for a very long time. For as long as we, I mean, we grew up in a yeah. world in which that middle section of the Eurasian continent was Divided. either yeah. inaccessible, yeah. Yeah. you couldn't go there, or you couldn't really do business with it, yeah. not much anyway, because it was under communist regime. It was divided, yeah. All of a sudden, it's no longer that. Now, the Chinese are no longer yeah. communists, they're very capitalist. And the Russians then, we know, I mean, after uh, the, uh, the, the end of the Soviet Union, that changes too. Then you have this huge landmass. And you would think that Europeans would be turning their heads away from the Atlantic Ocean to that landmass, as well as the Japanese. You'd think they would do yeah, the yeah. same thing. I wrote about this years ago for a Japanese um, intellectual magazine. You know, what, what are you doing to these people? Yeah. You should, both in Europe and in Japan, they should be turning their heads 180 degrees because yeah. that's where it's happening. It will still look to the US. In and of course, it is going to happen because the Russians and the Chinese together now are planning the biggest infrastructural projects yeah. Yeah. since the since the construction yeah. of the Suez Canal. Yeah. And, the new you know, Silk Road. Yeah, mm. The Suez Canal was of fantastic importance to trade. This is going to be of far, far, far greater importance. We're going to have high-speed trains between the coastal cities of China yeah. and ports in Western Europe. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a lot of other things that are very interesting. And the Russians and the Chinese are working together only because the United States has been pres putting pressure on both. So you're, you're, you know, you're yeah. pushing them together. Now, uh, uh, and this is the reason why the Chinese have started this Asian Infrastructure Investment exactly. Bank. It's all part of it. Now, you would think that in Europe and in Japan, people would be interested in this and would say, maybe we should turn our heads for a bit and see what's happening. But no. Nothing is happening like that. And we come to something very important, which is important both in Japan as well as in, in Europe. But we talk about, Japan, uh, about Europe. In Europe, you have something that, is, that has become a kind of a substitute religion. It's a, I call it a faith rather than yeah. a religion. And you can call it Atlanticism. And what is Atlanticism? Atlanticism was best exemplified um, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is the bigger one, the biggest one of the small countries in, in Europe. Yeah. And it also has, in some ways, it, is, it, 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 it sort of shows the, the, <laughs> the melodies of uh, the European case in, in many respects. Although on the outside, it looks one of the more successful countries. So. <clears throat> when uh, Cheney wanted to invade Iraq, there was a lot of discussion in Europe about this because it would be the first yeah. preventive war, which is something that, of course, tears apart the UN Charter. It goes against the basic rules. It was something that was condemned at the war crimes trial yeah. Nuremberg, yeah. you know, uh, 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 judgment over the Nazi leadership. It was a preventive war is a crime. But there was Cheney wanted to, uh, to engage in one. And there was a lot of protest in Europe against this. Huge, huge... Uh, yeah, negative uh, sentiment. Huh? Uh, yeah, I mean, huge rallies, huge demonstrations that were insufficiently covered or not covered at all by the mainstream media, by the way. But, okay, 
At that time, you had columnists and uh, commentators who were saying here in the Netherlands, without the United States, things won't work. Uh, we need them as a world's policeman. Zonder Amerika gaat het niet. That's how it was phrased. You would see that line again and again and again and again in opinion pages and so on. You'd hear it on TV all the time. That's, okay, that is the essence of Atlanticism. The idea is that the United States, yeah. that has always been our protector throughout yeah. our, the, the lives that we are politically alert. I was born in 1941, you a little bit later, but yeah. you also grew up in that world, as did most of the people around us in Northern Europe. And so... But it's <laughs> changing now. People, people are looking through the smoke screen, and if we see China, you know, supporting Russia, uh, then the unipolar world, which uh, the U.S. Uh, would like to see Willem, continue for some time, Willem, let, let me stops. tell you something. Let me let yeah. me tell you something. Of course, it matters. The more people wake up, the more people see it, the better. But it doesn't have much of a political effect. I think that lots of people around us have understood this already for quite some time. Mm -hmm. They write to me, they email me, they write to me. They respond very favorably if I say, if I have a chance to say this on a mainstream media outlet, like a daily newspaper, a morning newspaper or so. But it doesn't matter because it's just not the people who are it. And the people who are in charge aren't really in charge. So you we don't have, you don't believe in we, democracy anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, we are drifting that's off. Uh, I mean, I, I'd like to talk about democracy. Yes, of course, <laughs> it's one of my main subjects. But uh, but we are drifting off. We are now talking about Atlanticism. Atlanticism is like a faith, and a faith, like an ideology, mm -hmm. gives answers to almost everything that you want to know about, okay? But I think you so make your point fits. on Atl Atlanticism. Well, then <laughs> you have a church of Atlanticism, and that's mm -hmm. NATO. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, North Europeans who believe that NATO is there to protect them. It's I mean, that's defensive. understood. It's a defensive yeah, yeah, yeah. We organization. Need it. We need it because it will protect us. Yeah. Protect us against whom? Well, of course, the Russians. Russians. <laughs> yeah, of course. Are the Russians about to invade Europe? Mm -hmm. There are no signs of this whatsoever. Yeah, the annexation of the Crimea. So Come, that please. helps, no. that helps, because then we can <laughs> make Russia an enemy again. Of course. And it's been a boon for NATO, because NATO is, NATO is an asset for Washington. NATO make, it's two things. You have reserve troops in Europe for operations you want to carry out and that you can't get enough soldiers to do, that's one. And secondly, they spend money. All those defense budgets in Europe yeah. spend money and almost all that money goes to American manufacturers. So yeah. it's a wonderful thing to have. So NATO is a crucial point of Atlanticism. It's, you could say, the church of Atlanticism. It is dangerous. When I say NATO is the most dangerous organization in the world, people in the Netherlands around me think I'm totally crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, most of my friends, I lived in East Asia, not only Japan, but most of East Asia for more than half my life, almost well, 40, 40, 45 years. And so when I came to the Netherlands, came to Europe, most of my friends, of course, were Atlanticists. I was Atlanticist yes. then during the Cold War, of course. Mm -hmm. And some of them have high positions or used to have high positions. Also they, some of them think I'm crazy, and some of them don't quite know what to think. But for them, it is very difficult to adopt the view that I am trying to explain. They here. don't have the mental flexibility well, to change? It's, or? it's their whole social, it's their ambience, their social ambience. They grew up in it. All their friends are part of it. Their whole, po all their political affiliations so are part of this. Especially our generations, they f think it's very hard 
to believe that the US is not their best friend anymore. Our generation and the one after our generation, because they have not been sufficiently educated as to the realities of and, the present day world. And the younger generations, people who are young now, I think they're much more open to this maybe, belief. Maybe, but by the time they get to a position where they climb up and have political decision-making power, I mean, we will be way beyond the very critical moments in which we find ourselves today. But how do you see the future? <laughs> what, what, what will be the main developments from a geopolitical point of view in the next five to ten years? Now we know that China is supporting Russia and the US can't um, be world's policemen anymore. Of course, what Russia and China were doing, what we started on, the, the whole uh, landmass of Eurasia, is something that is outside the parameters of American control, which is one reason to explain the vehemence with which the decision makers in Washington that actually have had the upper hand, the neoconservatives and so on. Are they desperate? They are, I think so, because, you know, they, they see this, they see that control is being lost. Now, certainly you cannot, you cannot possibly think that the United States can control the whole world. That is, you know, this is a, to think so means you're in a psychosis. It's a, it's a, it's something that is uh, the unipolar discussion. From now on, the United States was going to be the only world, the only country power in the world that was going to dictate to everyone else. And of course, it had a very strong economic side to it. That's a very important thing we haven't discussed yet, but it's a very important part. And so, <coughs> you have military bases all over the world, American military bases, you know how many? Of 100, I think. Yeah? 100. The ones that are known, the ones that are official, are about 800. US bases? US bases outside. around the world, 800, yeah. official yeah. ones. Yeah. Then there are a number of unofficial ones, secret ones, and there's an estimate that's about 200. So let's say there's a thousand military bases in how many over countries? the world. Over one no, countries? Everywhere. I mean, not in the countries that do not want American uh, uh, presence, but this like sounds... North Korea, but the rest, <laughs> yes. This sounds so... like imperial overstretch. <laughs> well, this is the good <laughs> question. And I think it's a crucial question. It's pathological. I call it a psychosis. It's something that obviously cannot continue forever. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. Europe has been dragged into it. And Europe has no brain, and it just allows itself to be dragged into this. Part of the American empire. Well, a empire, uh, let's, I mean, we discussed the, the, the definition of empire. Yeah, it's a kind of whatever Pax, we Pax call Americana. it. Whatever we mm. call it. It's so, but where is the control? I think Obama is a very, in, in one way, it's, an, it's the best illustration we have of a situation that is, that, that is characterized by a complete loss of control. Now look at most recent developments in Syria. They have lost it. The United States is engaged there. In what? There is pressure from some very strongly conservative and right-wing uh, uh, people and institutions in the United States that Obama should have boots on the ground. They should be in there. They should have entered the war in Syria and so on and so on. Well, they have been on the ground there all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's ISIS that is an instrument of the CIA. It's, an, it's, it's a CIA You really asset. believe this? Yes, you leave it. You have to, you have to study its... You have to really understand how it came about and then how it was used. What, what's that the proof? That is known. It's known. It's, it, is, it, is, it is presented as the moderate opposition. There is no moderate opposition. It's a fiction. You have to picture. The fiction is necessary, and all the newspaper readers in Northern Europe have to believe that this fiction is real because the newspapers are full of it, of how the moderate opposition is gaining or not gaining, and so on. And the moderate opposition also wants to get rid of Assad. 
But the reality is that there is no moderate opposition. There's a whole melee of different outfits, different, and then you have the Kurds and you have the Turks that are, that are involved in, in all manner of ways. So what is there is a strong wish on the part of the people who are still most important in Washington want to get rid of Assad. They haven't given up that idea. So Obama is handing to uh, his successor the, the, you know, a situation in which either they push further and overthrow Assad, which probably means you get a chaos like you have in Iraq and in Libya, the same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And <clears throat> Lawless society. Of course. And so uh, this is one thing. But the, th the important thing is that they've lost control. They can't oversee it. The US. I think yeah. also that within the agencies, you have rivalry. You, first of all, you have rivalry amongst the intelligence agencies. You have the NSA and the CIA, they're enemies. You have parts of the Pentagon with other parts of the Pentagon that are working across purposes. We have seen this also in Syria. So you have a situation that I know well about studying Japanese history and even studying contemporary Japanese history. You have a situation in which there is no clear center of political accountability. And that is a situation that uh, can lead to great disaster. In the United States, you have no center of political accountability. Obama has never been a true central leader. And people say that's because of Repu Republican sabotage, Republican opposition, and so on. Uh, wait a moment, of course, but that's not the essence of it. But the you... essence of it is that the whole system there Look, let me, let me, another approach to this, another approach and then, to this. And then I have a question for you. No, <laughs> another approach to this. What are the most important uh, institutions that a state has to carry on policies, especially foreign policies? It is a military, of course. It is an intelligence apparatus. And it is a financial system. Very important. Mm -hmm. We know that the financial system <laughs> ruled over by the Fed, which is a private organization, by the way, a few people are aware of this, uh, is out of control. It's the, all about supporting the current dollar system. The big, the big banks, the big banks are not under control. I mean, there is some, mm -hmm. yeah, there is some, to, but it is not under control, polit effective political control. The White House is ruled by Wall Street. The military are not under effective political control. The intelligence world is not under effect. It's too big and it's too labyrinth. Yeah. It's labyrinths all over the place. Yeah. They don't even know their way around it themselves. So the White not House is not in control any longer. If the most important institutions with, with a state has to carry out diplomacy or foreign policy in general, and those things are not under effective political control, you cannot have an effective foreign but, policy. But do you accept the American empire to be in decline in the next 10 years or will we see a collapse? Well, it has force. It has material force. It has the force of seduction. It can seduce Europe. It has so far seduced Europe sufficiently that the Europeans have just like sheep followed it. Now, look at Europe. Why is that? Because Europe doesn't have a center of political accountability. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Brussels is yeah. not a center of political accountability. The no. Troika isn't. No. These are these are haphazard substitutes for something that a state ought to have. Europe, the European Union, is not a genuine state. So we're not in a position to, <coughs> to confront thanks to, the Especially earth. thanks to Mrs. Thatcher, who didn't want Europe to have a deeper political uh, organization. Thanks to her, we have a much wider European Union with lots of countries in the East that ought to have been temporary or waiting yeah. members and rather than, in, than an expansion in the depth where you have institutions that could actually take on the functions, some of the functions of the state. So, uh, so there is no center of political accountability. And therefore, when people say the Europeans or the European Union, who are they talking about? There, there are sentient beings in Europe 
I think well, you we'll, and I are sentient beings. Yeah. We can talk about these things. There are some others around us that can talk about these things. You can talk with very intelligent Europeans that have great capacity. You can talk about music like nowhere else in the world. You can talk about the theater like nowhere else in the world. You can, all right, there, Europe is full of capable, intelligent human beings, but there is no political yeah. sentient center. No. And who, so, who is our foreign minister? Who is the European foreign okay, minister? So no. It cannot have that. So we, what do you expect to happen in Europe, the next decade? Yeah, let me, let me yeah? Just, yeah, let me, let me, I don't want to predict the future just yet, okay? Before <laughs> we do that, let's... So what's happened in Europe? Europe was weak because of this. Because Miss, Mrs. Thatcher endowed Europe with this awful mm -hmm. situation where you've expanded and you have taken on far more and you have allowed the neoliberal forces of very large corporate corporations and their lobbies to dictate economic policy everywhere. So, so the US lost this situation. So we have um, a European situation is hijacked. There are two main hijackers. One is NATO. NATO is now in bed with the European Union, more so than ever before. But it's and so NATO has hijacked it politically. There's no longer possible to, to, to sort of separate, <coughs> separate was, political was, Europe from NATO. Was NATO hijacked by the neocons? Well, they didn't need to hijack it. it was Are a, they in control uh, over NATO, the, the neocon? Who is in control over what? Again, once you know, I don't want to. You can, yeah. That's that's of course always what we must study. I've been doing this in Japan for you know for 40, 50 years. Uh, you study who actually can pull the strings, who actually has it, and that may change over time. And that also sometimes is a matter of things just happening, one thing after another. You know, there's one famous definition of uh, history. You know, people were asked, you know, what is, how do you define history? There's a very famous British answer. It is one damn thing after another. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that's partly true. That's true. <laughs> that's partly true. Yeah. And of course, yeah. there are people trying to push yeah. it one way or pull it one way. But you could say <coughs> that the neocons, they hijacked the, the foreign policy and, and the military policy of the US. Yeah. And they are in control of, of, of the Not Pentagon. Not quite. Not completely. But if you see, if you, if you, if you see how NATO is if, looking okay, for now, regime change... Now you have generals in the Pentagon yeah. who are talking with their Russian counterparts. They have to, because they're scared. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't agree with what's happening. So they have to talk with their Russian in counterparts. In secret, you mean? Whatever. So, they're, they're afraid uh, for conflict. Of course. So... <clears throat> I, therefore, I mean, Syria is a very interesting case in point because we do not know exactly where the control lines go. I can only conclude after recent events in the last few weeks that the U.S. has really lost it. But so, is, uh, is the U.S. on a strategy going towards <coughs> a military conflict with Russia? Is that a goal? I think that the R2P people, I mean, we, talk, we talked about Samantha Power before, etc., and we talk about the arch uh, uh, neoconservatives, yes. They, they, they want, want a breakup of the Russian Federation. And they want Putin to go. Why? Because Putin is sort of an, a, 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 an obstacle, a main obstacle to this American full-spectrum dominance Crazy idea. But when China, Chinese, but when China is backing Russia and when China is backing Putin, the U.S. won't succeed. No, probably. Or we get not. a world war. Well, yeah. you see, there's also in the South China Sea, uh, the Chinese, of course, are active, and the Americans are responding to that. Now, the Chinese are actually active because they're responding to American provocations. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, Chinese made it very this. clear. You have to know this, yeah. but you can only know this if you dig into something that you, you don't find in the daily newspapers. But the Chinese made it very clear. We uh, don't, they said to the US, don't push us too hard. We can have war over the South China uh, yes, Sea. Yes, yes. Yeah. We don't accept it any longer that you are That's ruler right. <laughs> That's right. over... No. 
No, so, I mean, whoever is in charge in... You see, let's look at the fantasy world in which neocons and the R2P people thrive in Washington. It's about strength. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are talking about national strength. They want to show the prospective uh, voters that uh, they are for American strength. Americans should not be weaker again. When Trump says making America great again, as if it is not great now, which is mm -hmm. very different from what Hillary is saying, I, what he's talking about also, aside from a number of other things, we have to be a strong presence in the world. This notion of strength, this notion of strength and of being able to defeat evil is very strong. The comic books, people, children grow up with it, with their superheroes, yeah. and you know, they're all going after baddies and so on. It's the whole cowboys and Indians uh, story. But what, so, what, what, what will be the difference in foreign policy um, um, uh, between Trump and, and, and Hillary Clinton? What can we expect? What are the differences? We have really no idea. There's one, there are some clues, of course, and the clues are that in the case of Trump, he has uh, less made very clear that Trump uh, doesn't believe in this demonization of Putin. So that's a posi very positive point. Yeah. He doesn't believe that Putin is terrible and he believes that if you want to, if you want to live in a, in a good world, you have to do business with yeah. him. Yeah. So uh, uh, Hillary doesn't believe that because it's like doing business with Hitler. You don't do business with Hitler, and so Hillary is not going to do this. And Hillary, of course, is very closely associated with the neoconservatives. Yeah. Now, what you then mean, what you then can see, is that both the neoconservatives and the neoliberals, the whole, you know, the banking world, uh, uh, yeah. that is Wall, Wall Street, Street, of course, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, you name it, everything, that is, that is part of the Hillary crowd, as yeah. part of the Entourage, Hillary yeah. ambience. Whereas Trump, of course, Trump, I'm sure that at this very moment, uh, the Wall Street people are talking with Trump, and I'm trying to yeah. sort of to see how they can encapsulate him, as I think the Pentagon people are going to do very soon, or if they're not ready to doing it. So, uh, I, so I, then, I, <clears throat> what, 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 what does this mean? Well, it means that Hillary can start right away with a continuation of this nonsensical policy that, uh, that started under Obama to uh, finish the Ukraine coup by taking control over the eastern part of the country and by provoking Russia is more dangerous. I don't, I mean, so the, the immediate danger for the rest of the world would be with Hillary. With Trump, we don't know. Mm, no. This man is not, we, we really don't know. I sometimes, uh, I sometimes wonder, you know, whether he understands certain things, whether he has the depth. I'd say that there is a kind of a common sense element, but only an element. I don't know how large he, it he is. He couldn't have survived without it. <laughs> yes, there's a common sense element there that is lacking with Hillary. Hillary, yeah. there is no, I mean, he doesn't consult a common sense. Yeah. There isn't any. So. <clears throat> I, I read a nice line when I was reading into the neocons uh, last few days that the neocons are more interested in confronting enemies than in cultivating friends. No, obvious. You said... You what said, took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm much younger. Um, I call it, you, you, you said know, before... You, you said cultivate before. friends through diplomacy, but they and have given up diplomacy long ago. You bully people. Instead of you, I mean, there's no diplomacy. When is the last time that the Americans engaged in real life, high stakes diplomacy? It was when they discussed with Gorbachev what would happen after the demise of the Soviet Union and the unification of Germany. It was about NATO and it was about expansion of NATO as a last diplomacy because would Washington agree would Russia agree to a unification of Germany, the two Germanys? Mm -hmm. And then the Russians said, OK, once the Americans told them NATO would not move one east inch west. to the east. That was, the, that was on Malta. That was the last moment of 
really high stakes, high level yeah. American diplomacy. <laughs> Since then, we have had bullying. And now Hillary said that the Russians bring their military to our doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you replace your doorstep all to the time, these. and then of course yeah. they're bound to they're bound to stumble over it. So, so you, but you know there are many things people are unaware of. <clears throat> Japan, for example, not unimportant in the whole East Asia sphere. Japan in 2009 had, for a brief period, a reformist political government. It ended a half a century of one-party government. Mm -hmm. The LDP had also always been in government or halfway in government through coalition or whatever. And then all of a sudden, the new party, the Democratic Party of Japan, Minchito in Japanese, the first thing, one of the first things they did was to say, we want better relations with our neighbors. Hmm? Well, that's obvious, that's what you want. Yeah. And so the first president, uh, Hatoyama, he wanted to uh, open up to China. He wanted better relations with China and also with Russia, but Russia would wait a little. And also, Hatoyama was interested in something that the Southeast Asian nations had wanted, the ASEAN group, ASEAN plus three, that is ASEAN countries, Southeast Asia, plus Korea, South Korea, and China and Japan. The United States didn't want that. So <clears throat> very soon after they came to power, uh, the United States began to make trouble. That ended in the overthrow of this first cabinet. What happened, I was right, I was sitting on it with my nose on top of it. I saw it. I was, you know, it, it, there were so many clear clues that I got from yeah. people in Washington and from people on the ground out of Washington and from my closest. And I knew some of the top people in, the, in this, this party. Yeah. When I got married in Japan, that party sent us use a huge flower arrangement to the embassy. Uh, they were friends because I had been writing all those books for Japanese readership about how to create a center of political accountability, which is what they wanted to do. The United States didn't want that in Japan, okay? So, through indirect means, the newspapers in Japan, plus a trap that was set up for Hatayama to step into, this was about Okinawa and decisions about that Okinawa, which is occupied by American troops, that government ended, okay? I wrote about it in, uh, in December of 2009. By the way, that government had come to power with an overwhelming, an absolutely overwhelming mandate. All Japanese wanted it to succeed. So, <clears throat> when <clears throat> I came to Japan in November following, I met Hatoyama, who was the overthrown prime minister. And he said to me, he'd read what I'd written, and he agreed 100% with what had happened. He said, it's the biggest political mistake in my life. What was the biggest political mistake? He walked into the trap. That trap was set by Hillary. So, so <coughs> is the US still in control over Japan, over their foreign policies? And well, that's a very good question. Yes and no. Um, the short term, yes. Um, for the long term, it's different from Atlanticism. You know, Atlantic, you, with Atlanticism, you have allies that were allied with the United States uh, throughout, throughout mm -hmm. the, the Second World War. Of course, not yeah. Germany. But uh, Japan wasn't an ally, it was an enemy. Yeah. And although it was defeated, and though after the defeat, Japan, you know, the stronger country was, uh, strength is very important in Japanese political imagination, of course, it's very important. Uh, strength rather than principle. So, <clears throat> so um, Japan had no choice also, I mean, it was, was obvious. But it doesn't go as deep as Atlanticism goes in Europe. Interesting also is that, so Germany as well as Japan are in very interesting situations, both of them, because neither of them are free countries since they were defeated. I mean, also Germany. Yeah. Germany has got lots of arrangements with mm -hmm. the United States, lots of, of agreements and even secret agreements yeah. where it is not free 
to do what it would want or should want. And Merkel, Merkel is a perfect example of someone who is forever looking over her shoulder to see whether she gets the OK from Washington. Yeah. In that respect, she is like on a gear, like an East German uh, political yeah. head who always has to check whether Moscow agrees or not. When will this change? <clears throat> Well, first, what, of what all, is needed? first of all, I mean, in the case of Germany, of course, it would mean a very different uh, set at the top. Um, in Europe, when you ask me, uh, when you ask me, will Europe forever be a, um, a, a an entity, a political entity, which is what it is, without a political center, without a genuine political center? That, of course, is a crucial question. Uh, what do you expect? Will it forever be that? I hope not. But what would it take? A sudden revolution, a sudden crisis, a sudden a war? What would it take? I think at the moment, uh, any such crisis would be devastating. Um, what do you expect? So, I don't expect anything. You know, honestly, William, I, I mean, I'm not just, you know, trying to avoid the, the, the question here. Although, yeah, I mean, as a journalist, you'd never predict the future. As a professor, which I was for, what, nine years, uh, um, you, uh, professors do it all the time, with yeah, predicting the future. I'm asking the but professor. I have not, no, I have not adopted that, <laughs> that habit. But you can say, if this, then that. Yes, I can, I can follow that kind of line of, of but argument. Should we, should, should we be worried? Yes. In Europe? Yeah, very much so. So what should we do, <coughs> besides making videos like this? <laughs> well, I think that everyone in the world uh, should write letters to the publications that they read, newspapers, magazines, etc., and saying, look, Stop with your self-censorship, give us the true story, become curious again. Look, what has happened to journalism, we were talking about that before. Journalism is one of the reasons why it's gone kaput, is because journalists today are made to feel guilty for their curiosity. I mean, if they are too curious, you're conspiracy the idea, theorists. They are accused of being conspir believing in conspiracies. Well, yeah. my friend, the police always used to believe in conspiracies, and we sure hope they still do. Historians, the bo their books are full of it. Shakespeare, it's one great, you know, in many of his plays, one great history of China. Of his, <laughs> all more conspiracies. Yeah. Journalists, of course, they believed in conspiracies. Conspiracy became a word to a conspiracy theory, became something you didn't want to have attached to yourself after the Kennedy murder. Hmm. I remember myself reading Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, which was the first critical book on the Warren Report. Yeah. And it was convincing. Of hmm. course, Oswald could not have done it. On, it was, was obvious. Official story couldn't be true. That could not be true. Now, of course, like today, <laughs> more, more than half the American population doesn't believe it. So, so, but that book then triggered a lot of action, and one of them was, it was a CIA-inspired, this is now understood by quite a few Americans, that it was a CIA-inspired uh, move to weaponize the term conspiracy theory. Yeah. So today, if you ask about unanswered questions, if you ask the unanswered questions, if you follow up on clues that don't make sense as a journalist, you immediately are <coughs> painted with a dark brush of conspiracy theorists. The same if you have criticism on it Israel. Means, it means you feel guilty. The same if you have criticism on Israel. You yeah, well, then they call you anti-Semitic. You know, anti that is also, it makes you feel guilty. You can't talk about Israel oh. in, um, in, you can't talk about Jewishness in general in the world without King. risking that, uh, uh, without risking that term, yes. I, I would like to, um, to go there, to touch on it. If you look at the names on um, the Project for a New American Century, which was also part of the neocon group, and you look at all the names, the Wolfowitz, there are many Jewish names. We know there's a strong connection between Israel and the US. It's not so much their names, it's the, the, what we know about their, uh, their, 
heritage, what we know about their backgrounds. What, what uh, do we what do we know? Well, they were very they were close to uh, Netanyahu. You know that that uh, project for a new American century, that manifesto that grew out of a report that was originally prepared as a kind of a foreign policy paper for Netanyahu. And, and this the, was the report talking about we need preemptive wars. We, well, we, well, yeah, the control of the whole Middle East and, and all that. Uh, and so, yes, I mean, this is, this is not a secret. Uh, the, but when I, you know, in an interview uh, at the time of the Iraqi invasion, I made a, a remark saying that those uh, neocons are on the telephone with Tel Aviv all the time. And I got the rejoinder on the front page of one of the Amsterdam papers accusing me of anti-Semitism. Now, the link is unclear to me, but yeah. okay, that's, uh, you know, it's Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> it's a very tricky subject. It goes deep, it goes far. Um, we know too little about it, and very much of it is speculation. And this is one thing about conspiracies. Mm -hmm. The moment you start asking questions about unrevealed things, you enter an area where a lot of work has been done, also a lot of work to sabotage what you're doing. And so what you will find is that on purpose, some, some characters, some people active on the internet, uh, some people writing, will appear to join the, say, the conspiracists, the people who believe that something or other that is not the official story, and then they exaggerate it. Mm -hmm. Or they link it with something else that is clearly insane, like flying saucers mm -hmm. or like, uh, you know, or whatever. There is many things that are, the, that the moon landing took place in a TV studio and never took place in reality, or something along those lines. You have to be very careful. The moment that you start going after things that have remained hidden in the mainstream media, the moment you do that, you have to be very careful to stay clear of this kind of thing. Yeah. And a lot of speculation you should just keep in the back of your mind as possibility, speculation, but don't go out and start with it because you have no idea what you're getting into. No, but we know the neocons, um, they work together with the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. Is this institute who, who's been calling for regime changes in Libya and Iraq, so we know there are connections. Yeah, um, but there's no secret about no, that. No, no. I mean, no, I mean, this is very obvious. They, look, they, they have made it clear because of what they want what they've wanted to do, they have clearly set out. I mean, it's, there's no secret to this. But is the US foreign policy influenced a lot by the Netanyahu's? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, we have, of course, heard uh, from uh, different sides that uh, Obama and Netanyahu don't get together, yeah. don't get on together. Yeah. That's uh, but then, of course, Obama, <laughs> as we've just established, Obama doesn't yeah. control foreign policy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting question, and there are. Oh, I mean, what's your take? Most of the most of the best uh, most of the best thinking on this subject, of course, is American. I mean, it's done by uh, American. Well, what's your take? Well, there are some schools that say, you know, in a way, it's Israel that is the dog and wagging the tail and uh, the US is the tail, or it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make an argument for both sides. Uh, but these regime changes yeah. are very beneficial to Israel. Yeah, they're beneficial. Well, they are and they aren't. And then when you see other things happening, you know, it, the Israelis have not given up on diplomacy, for example. I mean, Netanyahu talks with Putin. And then, yeah, it talks with Erdogan in Turkey. Mm -hmm. I mean, they still, he still engage in diplomacy. Yes. Uh, they are, uh, in, they are crazy in another way. They're, just, they're in their way. In the long term, of course, they're undermining the safety and the security of their own country, and also that can't go on forever. I imagine. Do you see Israel surviving way. the way it is? I have no idea. I'm not. Uh, I don't p predict the future. No. You're a professor. You... Yeah, I know. I can't. <laughs> As a professor, I can, but okay. I won't. I won't be tempted wow. <laughs> to do this. Thank you for this talk. Thank <laughs> you for welcome. this interview. Bye.